Contrasense is a podcast that focuses on subjects from the social sciences field. This time you are listening to Marina and my guest today is Neda Deneva Fage from the Babes Boyo University. She is a researcher in the project Prec Work, which we are talking about across more episodes of our podcast. Ambitious research projects are often a source of knowledge and empirical data about diverse aspects of our life. Not so often is this knowledge made accessible for a wide public. And this is exactly what we are trying to achieve with this collaboration. In the last episode, Maria discussed with Eniko Vince, also a part of the project, about the current challenges people face in a former mining city, especially when it comes to housing. And today, we are talking about labor and what does it bring to the working people in Bayamare. For those who didn't listen to the previous, uh, the previous episode, I would like to uh, begin with asking you if you can tell tell the, the listeners what is the, the project uh, about. Hi, Marina. Nice to see your face. So I'll start with telling you the very long title of the project, which is called Precarious Labor and Peripheral Housing, the Socioeconomic Practices of Romanian Roma in the Context of Changing Industrial Relations and Uneven Territorial Development. Since this is too long, we actually <laughs> yes. refer to the project as Prec Work. Uh, from precarious work, but we all know that it actually contains a more dimensions than just uh, precarity and uh, labor. So our um, idea was to look at uh, reindustrialization in one region in Romania, which is the uh, northwest Transylvania, around the city of Bayamare. Uh, we chose it because we knew that it was a heavily industrialized region um, during the socialist period. And then we knew that there was a process of deindustrialization, like in so many other uh, places around the world. Uh, but recently, in the last 10 years, we could observe, um, as anthropologists and sociologists who also have some connection to, uh, some personal connection to the region, we knew that there are uh, new processes of reindustrialization, albeit uh, industries are actually different than what it used to be. So we wanted to see what's going on there, how does this reindustrialization affect different aspects of life. And we wanted to connect this question of more macro, this more macro dimension of uh, reindustrialization with the uh, living and working conditions of the local uh, Roma population, but also Hungarian and Romanian uh, citizens who live under uh, precarious conditions. So that's how we connect precarity and labor and housing conditions in the context of um, reindustrialization. This is the, the very short version of saying it. It sounds really good. And uh, you say that uh, you noticed, like uh, you as a group, and I wanted to ask you a short question about uh, how is the work organized? I understand that you are working as a, as a group and you are collaborating with each other on this on this big project with this big name so you have different aspects which are pointed to different researchers if i see it right yeah it's exactly right so we are uh, most of us are colleagues from uh, babbage boyer university from the departments of european studies and uh, sociology we also have norwegian partners who are looking at just one dimension of romanian migrants in norway Uh, and they try to trace the connection with particularly this region. But the rest of us come from different perspectives and uh, different historical periods and try to put together one coherent story of the region, which is actually unusual compared to other projects that have one research question and probe it in different locations, sometimes different states. We do the opposite. We have this big research question, but then we ask sub-questions that have to do with housing, that have to do with labor, that have to do with territorial development of the and urban development, that have to do with a more uh, longer historical period. So to trace from socialist industrialization through the industrialization into the current period. And we try to help each other by exploring deeper these different dimensions to help each other build this kind of more comprehensive uh, picture. Our PI is uh, Enika Vince, and then we work also with uh, senior researchers with Soringog, with Gabriel Trock, 
with Cornel Ban, uh, myself, and Mara Marginian, who deals with the uh, historical aspect. And then we also have a lovely team of younger researchers that are working very actively with us. So we are very proud of our team and of the fact that uh, we help each other understand a field better. And just one more sentence, why is this important? Usually I'm an anthropologist, for example, and when I go do field work by myself, I focus on observing, on talking to people, giving them enough time and space, on sometimes participant observation, as you would know what the anthropology entails, anthropological field work. But then unless I find secondary sources and secondary literature, which often is a problem, on specific questions of uh, interest in Eastern Europe, then I'm left with, if only I could have a historian look through the archives, if only I had a quantitative scientist who would help me get make sense of the numbers, if only I had a political economist who could explain the macro picture. And then, you know, you dig in your niche, but then the rest of the questions remain unanswered. And this is what we try to actually overcome here this kind of uh, challenge and of course we'll see when we publish the different articles whether we uh, succeeded in this but so far it uh, it sounds exciting that's really nice and i think this is actually the i hope you know the future of the academical research that people are working together in interdisciplinary teams and uh, just putting, you know, uh, common knowledge together and c different perspectives, as you say, brings uh, brings us already um, much further. I wanted to say, to ask you actually, um, who are the, the industrial workers of nowadays? If you if if you can if you can answer to this question in in relation to Bayamare and to the industrialization and reindustrialization there, who who are these people and what kind of work are they doing and what does it mean? Yeah, that's um that's a very relevant question. I think so. My work package deals with labor mostly, and what we wanted to see is exactly what happened with the old working class industrial workers from the uh, socialist period and who are the current industrial workers. The answer has a lot to do with what type of industries we have now. So while in the uh, late socialism, we had a lot of mining, heavy industry, uh, metal processing and so on. Uh, and this required very heavy, difficult physical uh, labor. Uh, now we have lighter industries, so furniture, textile, uh, some uh, shoe production. So this is a different type of labor that is performed. Uh, the biggest factories in uh, Bayamare are uh, working on furniture production. The very big one, Aram, is mostly, from what we understood, uh, works for um, is as a subcontractor for IKEA furniture. And the others around also work on furniture mostly. And then we have a lot of physical labor involved in an industry which could have been probably uh, much more technologized and using much more sm smarter decisions. But mm -hmm. instead, they're using manpower. And this manpower comes from the local uh, workers who, even if they're not necessarily low-skilled, they are used as low-skilled labor. So they lift, they scrub, they breathe dust. Um, and it's this kind of very old fashioned kind of um, industrial image that, uh, that you get from, from the stories that they tell and from the production that, uh, that they describe. Uh, what we see is that there is a lot of, uh, there is a shortage of uh, uh, labor. So everyone who wants to work can find a job. In the biggest factory, there are not even um, requirements for education, which is not the case in other factories, but in Aramis, which employs more than 5,000 people uh, nowadays, they hire everyone. Even if you don't have primary education, even if you can't read, they would hire you. So as you can imagine, the answer is that the majority of these low-skilled workers, or at least hired as low-skilled uh, workers, are the local Roma population. 
and this has and this has its implications for the kind of working conditions that people are offered, for the kind of social security that they can uh, get access to, and so on. I think it's very interesting what you are saying about the low technologization of the processes, because they say, you know, a capitalist firm would uh, not invest in, in some, in some advancement, advancements in the, in the technology as long as they can just use people and pay them less money as they should be investing. And I wanted to ask you, how, how does it come this, uh, that, for example, this, uh, the furniture factories are not interested in getting more advanced and more technologized? And uh, what's the structural uh, condition of, of this way to, to work and to make uh, their business? So this is a teaser for the next episode. <laughs> this question, Cornel Baum okay. will answer perfectly because it's his observation, this paradox that they could invest more in research and development in a more complex technology so that they can actually make a bigger profit. But instead, what happens is that they just, the local industries rely on cheap labor, but they don't make enough profit. They don't develop enough I don't fully understand this, so I can't give you... For him, it was still a question and he could observe that this is the case, but he couldn't necessarily explain why this is the case. And what we see in the other work practices is the result, the effect of this kind of um, development, local development. So I would say that uh, you keep these questions and then we build on them with the, with the next episode because they are, as you see, these are very connected issues. My explanation from my corner of the project is that there is simply this huge pool of workers. There is always someone available to come work. The money that they pay are close to the minimum salary, even if it's sometimes uh, slightly higher. And there are always workers. And there are reasons for the fact that there are always available workers for which will uh, to which we'll get later, I guess. But it's not like in other uh, regions where people have out-migrated, where it's been like regions in Bulgaria, but also I could imagine that in the east of uh, eastern parts of Romania, you have regions where nobody is left. People out-migrated either internally or they went abroad. And even if you make a factory there, there just won't be enough workers. This is not the case in Transylvania. This is not the case in Maramures and in um, uh, Bayamare. There are available workers. So maybe, you know, it's not worth the effort to do anything else. Just use the and reproduce the labor force. It makes me also ask myself and ask you, how do these people manage to work in these conditions? And as you said, it's it's a lot of physical work. It's a lot of, you know, not that easy and relaxed. Not that any work is relaxed, but for an industrial worker, it's it's obviously that you feel different if you work eight hours in, in this factory and you have to carry chairs and tables and uh, I don't know which kind of other uh, furniture uh, pieces. And I, I, I know like a little bit from the, you know, the social history of uh, Romanian people that there are many which go outside and you just uh, notice it as uh, in Eastern uh, Romania, there are many people who already left the country or they left for a, for a shorter time and maybe you can tell me also the the situation in Maramures and in Bayamare is it is it somehow similar are people just working the whole time in these factories or is it a temporary work they are doing because I cannot I cannot imagine that someone could do this work you know for 15 years without break yeah you're going straight to the interesting stuff right so yeah, maybe to take this a bit at the beginning, if you allow me, uh, my initial uh, idea of the kind of research question that I wanted to ask in this work package was what would happen if there is available formal, stable employment, long-term employment to the local um, Roma population uh, who can just choose to stay and work this. What would happen with their lives? What will happen with their self-identification? Would they become more working class? Would they develop some form of um, stability in their lives? Would they start relying on uh, the welfare 
uh, that could be available for them. And most importantly, would they develop some form of solidarity and some form of unionization? So in a way, even I ask this in our um, work package, is there a process of reproletarianization through the ongoing reindustrialization? The reason why I was asking this question has to do with my previous research on Bulgaria, uh, where I did research with the similar Roma population that uh, historically the previous generations were involved in industrial labor and then they uh, lost their jobs because of the closing down of factories and then they were left with very few opportunities for work in Bulgaria, mostly agricultural, informal, and they started migrating, but not full-time migration, but this back and forth hyper migration. They would go three months in Germany or in the Netherlands, work a little bit informally there, then come back to Bulgaria, work informally in agriculture or picking up uh, forest fruit and whatnot, and so on, back and forth. And what they were telling me back then in 2013 and in 2014 is if only there was some industry here, which is a trope that came not just from the Roma and workers, but also from the local authorities. If only there was in, in some functioning industries here, these people would get jobs, they would be stable, they would have better housing, their children would go to school and so on. This is uh, clearly something that comes with the whole workfare idea of not just assisting poor people, but making them work. All of the Roma uh, integ reintegration programs have to do with reactivation, being uh, ready for the labor market, which would provide jobs if only they could work. So, you know, these questions kept being there. What would happen if we have this? So then we ask this question for a context where we already have the available formal, we knew that the employment is formal, that people work with, it's not the black market, you know, it's not uh, working on, what's the word in uh, Romanian, la negro. <laughs> we knew that, so we wanted to see what changed, how did it change for them? Something says to me that, you know, having a working place and a job, it's not enough for someone to, to live, you know, we are not just working people. We are also some kind of other creatures. We have also some other needs. So I, I think yes, we. I understand. Uh, I understand where does it come that uh, that the authorities and uh, maybe some you know some um, people who are writing uh, policies uh, are hoping for this because this is something you can you can do you can say okay people you have just to you just have to work and everything will be all right but i can imagine that this is not everything you need especially if uh, as you say some of these workers or many of them are roma so they they have some other struggles in in romania they have to to live with the with the structural racism and with uh, very low chances to education and very few possibilities to do something what they like or what they find interesting and reasonable for them. So, uh, yeah, tell me uh, how, how it turned out. <laughs> yes, this, is all very, this is all very legitimate because that's exactly the point that people are not just uh, working beings, laboring beings, they're social beings, they're humans they want to you know live in a group feel comfortable have aspirations have future plans they are not that are not connected necessarily to just dying on your workplace uh, but what we saw and this takes me back uh, in a very winding way to to your previous question what are the working conditions is that yes the job is secure there always is work for the people who want to go to work but it's extremely hard physical labor they don't lift chairs they lift sofas because mostly the furniture in this field so we also have other smaller factories that are textile factories where uh, mostly women work there the conditions are different but the big two or three big um, uh, furniture factories require really a lot of hard labor hard labor that is hard on the body and when you do it every day continuously from Monday to Saturday, because in all of those places, the working week is six days and you only get your bonus if you go continuously for six days and not for five days. So it's kind of, you know, it's not only that it's hard physical labor, but you only have one day to rest. 
uh, there are night shifts and you can't opt out of the night shifts. You have to go for the night shift. So you can imagine that this is very hard on the body combined with the fact that most of the uh, Roma uh, that we talk to work uh, live in very difficult conditions. They work in these unregulated neighborhoods um, that are, you know, small houses without running water, without proper electricity and so on. Their physical health is quite bad. And when you need to go and work in such a place, you can't work all the time. So this is going back to what you asked. Yes, they either work for 15, 70 years and then their bodies collapse and they can't anymore. But 17 years is not enough for a working cycle, right? It's you're supposed to be working for 30 years to get retired. Or they start taking different forms of breaks. I can imagine that it's not enough because the working conditions are not very friendly. They are not secure long term. And since they are too demanding for the body, you don't feel committed and cannot say, okay, I will do it because you don't think it gives you something in the end. I must say that in Romania, it's hard to buy a home for people earning more than minimum wage. And these industrial workers from Baia Mare are working for less than minimum wage or almost minimum wage. So they can even less hope or have a chance that they will ever manage to buy a house. I don't know who will do this work in these conditions. It's very difficult to imagine the future. And here it's very important to look at the uh, uh, differences that we have between different workers. So there are the generational differences where you have the younger people whose body are still able, who are strong, and they don't see a problem in this work. They just go, work, get the money, and you know continue their lives, as opposed to older people, meaning above 50, who just cannot continue with this kind of work. Um, and The, so there is more to say to this, but the other difference is um, mostly related to housing. Um, and we did a small survey within the project in the different precarious uh, housing areas uh, in, Bayam, in uh, yes, in Bayamare. And one of the questions was, can you afford to buy a place to live in Bayamare? And the answer was unanimously no. So people live in what they already have. If they live in a Kraika or in a Pirita, they live in this kind of very small uh, buildings that they built by themselves that are not regulated. No road really goes there. No, no uh, elect electricity is sold by the neighbors and so on. Um, but they could also live, come from a village. So what, ha and this is a big difference. If you come from a village, irrelevant of whether you're Roma or another ethnicity, um, you have much higher chances to own your house. You have much higher chances to have some small patch of land where you can grow something on the side, maybe even keep some animals. Um, and you're, you can get extract water from the ground so you don't pay for this. Um, depending on the villages, we met some very entrepreneurial, let's put in a good way, mayors who actually took care of their uh, communities, of their Roma communities, and really made the conditions in these uh, neighborhoods much better for people. And then, you know, they commute to work, but they don't live in the same really bad housing conditions and, as those living in the city. So for them, the salary in the factory is enough for their social reproduction, while for the people in the city, this is not the case. Nobody can afford to buy a flat, nobody can afford to buy a house unless they are part of some shady uh, business group. So this is this makes you know the group of workers very diverse. We have people who start from a different uh, position and they have different expectations and different possibilities to make future plans. And this is very important when we think of labor conditions in general, to go back to what you suggested, that people are not just workers. Um, but also working conditions are not just about working conditions. You can have okay working conditions, good salary, um, access to social welfare, and so on. But then if you live in the kind of um, arrangement where you have to take care of another 
five or six family members, if you are the only person working, if you don't have a home, if you don't own your home, uh, then your salary, even if it's above the minimum, is actually not helping you to reproduce your life, right? So we, we, I think this is a big problem with policy making in general that we think in boxes and we think compartmentalized um, and we don't see the bigger picture. So one of the issues that we wanted to do in, in our work package is exactly to pay attention to gender roles, to age, to the group dynamic and look at how labor interacts with social uh, reproduction and how labor conditions per se might be okay, but that's not enough to make a decent life um, working in these uh, in these factories. And people find different uh, solutions how to come out of this situation. Yeah, which are these kind of solutions or what, what kind of escape uh, rooms and places uh, do these people have in order to to survive or to be able to to earn their money? Because even though they have so so complicated uh, living conditions and they are not owners of, of of houses or they don't have big perspectives perspectives for their for their pension in when they will get old, what what are the How how are they living at all, and how how are they managing this this hard uh, working conditions to 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 live with them to survive? Yes, one way they manage in different ways, but one way that was surprising for us and it was a a discovery was that actually employment is not as stable as we expected, and people there are some people some categories of workers that actually uh, have a very flexible approach to uh, their work. So they work for three months in the factory and then they quit um, and go work as migrants um, in different Western European countries. Then they come back and if they were okay workers, they're immediately rehired um, in the factory so they could work again. Then if the night shifts and the physical labor becomes too much, they quit again take a break, maybe work as seasonal workers in Bayamare, especially in the summer when there are different blueberries and blackberries and there are these kind of smaller farms around the city. People choose even if they make less money there. Some people choose to go there and literally say, I need to take a break. My body needs a break. I can't stand on my legs in this factory any longer. And then in September, you know, I'll go back with uh, when the seasonal work is over, I'll go back. Um, the factories allow this, and it's clear that this is a kind of um, scheme that works somehow for everyone. They facilitate contracts that finish just before the um, trial period. So there is this three uh, months of contract de proba. And then people sometimes quit just a few days before the end of the third month. And the HR in the factory knows that and allows it so that they can go back whenever Uh, without any, you know, in two weeks notice or one month notice, whatever is in the law. Actually, people who are working have also this possibility to take a break, uh, especially if it's, uh, you know, if you are tired and you cannot manage it anymore, you actually paying, you are paying this uh, social security money so that you can pay an unemployment uh, Uh, money as long as you can cannot work and in Romania it's also like that and my question to you also from a provocative perspective you know because there are some assumptions that there are people who uh, don't like to work and they uh, they just take advantage of other people especially here in Germany where I'm now this is this is a much bigger subject And, but I know that in Romania, it's also like that, you know, and there are people who are uh, thinking, even though I can imagine that your, your answer will, will tell me something else. And you told that already, that actually people doing this hard work, they just take breaks by working something else. What's, what's the, the deal with this unemployment money? Isn't there any possibility for these people to get it? Because I think this this could be a big help for the, uh, for them. 
That's the, the big question that um, both for Romania and for Bulgaria, if you, leave, if you read the policies, they sound good on paper. And uh, when you work in a formal employment with a contract, 45% of the brutal salary goes for the tax and the social contributions, right? Which is a lot. It's higher than in Austria, for example, or in Germany. It's not higher than in Bulgaria, but it's a very high share. What you're supposed to get for these contributions on a redistributive uh, basis is access to healthcare, access to unemployment benefits, access to pension uh, when you retire, but also access to um, uh, sick leaves, to sick pension, uh, pensia de boala, not sure uh, how it should be in English. Uh, so uh, to maternity leave and so on. So all of these different uh, social benefits that you're supposed to have access to. You asked about unemployment benefits. You can probably qualify if you arrange with your employer to, if you just quit, you don't qualify for unemployment benefits. But if you arrange with your employer that you lose your job, still what you would get as money from the unemployment benefits is so little, it's so far from the minimum salary and from the poverty line uh, that you, ca you cannot survive on this money. So what happens is that even when people have the right to access certain types of benefits, they don't think it's worth it because it's so little. And this is the case in Bulgaria as well, in uh, situations when there, there is no available employment and the clearest um, solution is to register at the unemployment bureau and just, you know, get some support. The money is so little that people don't even bother to register. So if, when you look at the statistics, this is also an issue to think about that you have certain unemployment numbers, but these are only the registered people and the rest are non-existent. So this is one issue, but also people in general, the people that we talk to, they don't trust the state as someone who would support them. And it's not surprising. Well, basically, most of the women who give birth in this community, they give birth earlier, so they don't start working and then take a maternity leave from uh, their job. So by the time they start working, this is something that they are not going to use anyways. Uh, most of them given the conditions in which they live and work, would die before they would retire. The life expectancies of these groups is extremely low. We try to find workers um, above 55 so that we can trace their memories from late socialism as already, you know, um, working people. And everyone said, well, they, they are not alive. We, uh, we don't know. Oh, yes, there is one person that I can think of. And this is very, very sad and very scary that you find people who are working and contributing to all of our well-being, producing furniture and all sorts of other things, collecting our garbage and everything. And then when they can actually reach the age for retirement, they're not alive anymore. So they can't rely on this. With healthcare, even if they have the right to, to use the healthcare, the conditions of the factories are such that you don't get the bonus if you don't work six days a week in a row. So people just don't call sick. They go and work while sick, unless they're really, really sick and there is some huge problem. So what we see is that they spend, they invest 45% of their income that the employer actually pays them, the brutal salary. They invest it in the state, and then they get nothing in return. And in a way, I got myself thinking, wouldn't they be better off if they worked informally and they just got all mm -hmm. the money in hand? It, it, it makes us ask these kind of more provocative questions, right? Because the social welfare system doesn't really support them in any way. I just thought about this public discourse. We have about some Romanian people just getting the profit from the state. This is so false and we should be able to make this widely known. What you just explained. I'm emotional now. It should be written with big letters in newspapers that there is so many people paying for us, people not being able to get any of these benefits, but paying for the rest, the pensions, the pensions these workers will never 
have, because they will never live long enough to have something from this, contributing to the common Romanian state and in the end not having anything out of it. And not even expecting to, to, to use it. I mean, they don't have a choice. Yeah, not, not even they that. Like they don't try to... But when you ask them about future plans, this is just not part of their imagination that, you know, one day I will retire. And this is really so crushing that there is no future, which is really scary. Um, and at the same time, you know, they produce these comfortable couches and sofas on which we uh, sit. So it's they also contribute with their labor to the middle class well-being. Um, so, yeah. And it's the thing is that anthropologists, sociologists write about these things. Christina Ratz writes about so much about policy, our colleague from uh, the university about policy, about the, the um, guaranteed uh, basic income, about the uh, minimum salary. But it's one voice that remains somewhere. This is not part of the big political discourses. The, when, when, you, when you want to win votes, you win them through populist mirrors saying, oh, the lazy Roma who don't work and just milk the welfare state and these cells. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, really disturbing. And uh, I really hope that, you know, with your project and with some others, it will be, you know, possible at some moment to just make the Romanian society, but also other society aware how how much social injustice we just have in, in our societies. And I wanted to ask you, is there any chance that in your report or in your findings at the end, the word exploitation will be used? Because <laughs> it sounds for me pretty much like exploitation, because these people, they don't get anything out of their life and out of their work, even though they like work themselves out until they cannot leave anymore. It's clearly exploitation, and these are exploitative conditions in which they are working and living. Um, what we are trying to do, though, and this takes me back to the beginning when you asked about our collaboration, it's not just collaboration uh, on an academic level, but we want it to, to take it a bit further, to make it a bit more open, and to actually try and collaborate with the local authorities and with the local NGOs, and hear what the practitioners have to say about this, because it's very easy to go and say, oh my God, these conditions are disgusting, these poor people, and blame. And we want to do that because that's what we feel, and it's also a very emotional reaction. But the people who work there on the local level, in the local government, they care, or at least the people that we talk to, they know what the situation is, they, they recognize it very well, and they're looking for solutions. So if we could help them with developing together, even if they are small solutions based on best practices from uh, other places, this could be some form of step forward. We can't change the, the policies on a national level with our project, but we could see what could work on a local level. I can give an example from our last workshop, uh, which we had with the local authorities in uh, August, that we were discussing uh, good practice from Bulgaria um, with the social mediators, people who go in the neighborhoods and help people fill out their documents, take them to the municipality, to the different institutions where they have to file documents. This sounds like something very small and very insignificant, but it fa in fact, it could make all the difference with having access to healthcare, with actually using, because you contribute as we discuss, and then you don't use it when you need it. And such kind of intermediary people could help them with at least getting access if, to these kind of different social benefits that, that, that they have, that they're entitled to. There are beautiful people working with uh, young children, uh, helping them to, to go to school, to go through school, supporting them. And you could see differences. You could see when talking to people how the previous generation, which are now like 18 year olds, they were kicked out of school and they were told that, you know, we don't have space for um, Roma children. But then the younger children in the same family who are now seven, eight, 12, they go to school. And they live in the same conditions, but they at least 
go to school. So there is some progress happening and we want to pinpoint also the, the openings and the possibilities. Of course, it would have been great if we could also talk to the managers of the factories. The big factory did not want to talk to us. No matter how much we tried at different levels, they did not want to talk to us. So, you know, you draw your conclusions based on their silence. But not all of the factories are like this. There is one of the factories where um, they produce shoes and they're famous for the fact that the workers, they're mo mostly women workers, uh, seamstresses, they had a um, strike and they managed to uh, win better conditions for their uh, paid holidays. Oh, wow. The rest of the people, the rest of the workers have heard about it and they know about it and it works as a kind of, so maybe this is the future that will come. I just expected it to have arrived already. And, and one of the reasons is exactly this flexibility of the, of the labor force, how people come and go, how they know that they can quit at any given moment, but it also atomizes them. It doesn't give a sense of a community, of a working community, of a group of people that can do things together. They feel like individual workers. So yeah, it's the beginning somehow. We shouldn't... I, and I think this is a big challenge for social researchers in general, that if you stay at the level of the research, you can get desperate and you might stop seeing hope in the future. But we, we, are too, we, we have to be responsible and not give up and marry this with activism and with action uh, to the extent that each of us can do it. I think we're just communicating telepathically with each other because you are talking and I'm, I'm amazed at what you are saying. And I think, oh, and then I have to ask this. And then I don't, I don't come to ask because you already, you already <laughs> talk uh, the, the answer of what I was thinking uh, about. Um, it, 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 yeah, you just said everything because I wanted to ask, is there anything we can do? And is there anything uh, we can maybe talk about or, uh, you know, promote? And I think uh, we just have to wait that the results of your project to get published. And after that, I would hope that everyone who's listening to this podcast just takes the information and I don't know, sends it to to some some bigger uh, media house so that IKEA hears about it, you know, because this is something maybe we can also try to do if they are not on, on, on in the city there in Bayamare. So you just get, maybe get this media attention and put pressure on these bigger factories. Uh, and I found very interesting at the beginning when you said that like it's supposed or people know, but it's not officially that these factories are producing uh, furniture for IKEA. And I find it very interesting that they always try to, and it's not just IKEA, there are all these big companies who have many, many uh, stages in their production and they always try to, to hide it or not to make it public. Like I was reading an article about Adidas and it was just the same because on, on, the, on the higher level, they say, okay, we pay our workers well and we try to do everything right. But if you do a research like this one, you see that at the very beginning of the, of the production, Uh, some nasty things are happening and no one wants them somehow but they still happen and we didn't uh, and we didn't talk about how how this uh, wood is coming into factories and uh, how is it collected and where it comes from and everything so may maybe you know this publicity could also be a way but everything you said it's, it's also very good and I, I hope that policymakers and we together as social uh, social uh, scientists or researchers will also have the power to to do something about it and not just get desperate and depressed well i think i mean what you're describing is clearly the supply chain logic of production and the subcontracting so official ikea factories have standards and checkups and uh, the control um, and then when they subcontract but it's not part of the same company, it's easier to go around and 
maybe put more pressure on the workers. Not necessarily, I mean, these are maybe not the worst working conditions that you can see even in the region, let alone in other uh, parts of the world, but they're still not great. But I do have a good example that uh, comes from Germany uh, during the initial Corona crisis and the first wave and the lockdowns in the meat uh, industry in Germany, there were big outbreaks because uh, migrant workers were working under horrible conditions. They didn't have protective gear. They were also dependent on their employer for uh, their housing. They were living in overcrowded flats, so they couldn't isolate. So what happened is that not only that they got sick, but also the whole region went into a different uh, category and was with, under a stricter lockdown. So the wider population actually saw that they can't just isolate themselves from the migrant workers that come and uh, are actually essential workers producing their food. And what happened is that the Union on Food and Beverages um, in Germany uh, pushed, used these cases and pushed hard. And a few months later, they managed to change the law so that in at least in the meat industry now you're not allowed to subcontract so many times because this is what happens the big firm says oh but we don't know what happens because we just hire these smaller companies and we can't control them all so this logic actually could be used in in different sectors maybe and lead to to, to better control of of the working conditions and of uh, what happens to the people in these industries There is hope. Let's, let's hope. Let's hope. Neda, I'm very thankful to you for this discussion and for everything you told me about the research project. And I hope that our podcast will help to spread the findings of the research project. Thank you that you also honored the invitation. It was a big pleasure to talk to you. And if you want to say some final words, please do it. Yes, I also am grateful that I had the opportunity to to talk about it at length, not just at the 10 minutes increments in conferences, you know. Uh, but also the truth is that the exciting thing is that we actually managed to, to win this project so that we could have three years working together so extensively to, to really understand those things deeper. Because as you say, we kind of suspect, we know, we read about other places, but when you see the details, And when you can connect them um, and you can exchange ideas with your colleagues, this, this really helps us to understand it better and then try to do something about it. So, you know, you, for me, it's a way to see how big research projects are not just about publishing some articles that nobody would read, but could be actually meaningful and helpful. Thank you for listening to ContraSense Podcast. My guest today was Neda Denevafaje. This episode is a collaboration with the Prec Work Project from Babes Boyo University. I hope you enjoyed the topic and our discussion. If you are curious about more, follow the internet page of the project that I will post in the description. It's an immense privilege to me to be able to record another episode of ContraSense and to engage in such an interesting discussion with Neda while also being recorded. Thank you for listening. Music by Kind Studios. You can find out more about ContraSense on our Facebook page. You can also listen to other episodes of our podcast on SoundCloud and everywhere where podcasts are. Let us know your thoughts or curiosities at our email address contrasense at protonmail.com. See you soon, stay close and until next time.